This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hello, intrepid Austrian fans. Back for another episode of the Human Action Podcast. I'm going solo this episode, and I think in light of all of the discussion about Trump's tariff proposals, that it will serve you folks if I just do an episode here on um, some elements of international trade theory and accounting that I think often Austrians don't encounter. All right. So I want to be clear, everything on the topic of international trade and computing what, you know, what's the trade deficit and is that a good concept and all that kind of stuff that you'll see in human action or man economy and state, that's all correct. But when I worked for Arthur Laffer briefly, um, in his writings, he talked about things in terms of the accounting and the current account uh, deficit, and the capital account surplus, and this and that. And what does that do with currency strengths and so on? And I just saw some more about the accounting and came up with other ways to explain via analogies to like a personal household or a corporation how to think about international trade. So I want to be clear in this episode, I'm not here to tell you that Trump's ideas are good or bad. I, I will link, if you missed it, I earlier did a, an episode of this podcast on the difference between, or how economists should evaluate tariffs versus income taxes. And so there, again, I was trying to be neutral. My personal thought would be, if you could cut government spending enough such that tariffs alone could raise the revenue necessary to fund typical government operations at the federal level, that that would be vastly preferable to having an income tax. But that alone is not enough to say, okay, so let's go ahead and do it because in practice, what happens if, as I think probably would happen anytime in the near future, they enact new tariffs or raise the rates on existing tariffs a lot. And even if they do allow some cuts in the income tax rate, but if they still have the IRS or they still have the personal income tax and corporate income tax, so they're still all in your business and it's just they lowered the rates somewhat, then it's not obvious at all that that's better than the current approach. All right. So I just want to be clear on that point. But that's not what I'm trying to do in this episode. I'm not here trying to say tariffs are good or bad. All I'm trying to do is clear up some of the confusion that I've seen on social media when people who are armed with some true statements about international trade or accounting in taxation, and then they go in and argue with each other. And a lot of times, um, I, I just saw it this morning, for example, that John Potteritz and uh, John Carney were arguing with each other about, could a tariff make things become more expensive at Walmart? And they were both relying on true principles from economics, and yet they each thought the other guy was nuts. Right. So it was just kind of funny that. So that's what I'm trying to clear up in this. So I think regardless of your stance, uh, this episode should help you. And at the very least, will give you ammunition with which to go into battle, whatever your side may be on this topic. OK, so one thing that you'll often see coming from. Free market oriented non-Austrians is they will say that. Um, the conventional discussion about tariffs gets things backwards, right? So if you listen to a typical proponent of protective tariffs, they might say something along the lines of, and I don't know if Trump has literally said this, but certainly many of his fans arguing on social media have said things like this, that, hey, we're all for open trade and you know competition on a level playing field. And uh, we're happy to buy imports from some other country but they should be willing to buy our exports. And if they're not willing to buy our stuff, then we shouldn't buy their stuff. And it makes it sound like the point of international trade is to get other people to, to take your goods and they're like doing you a favor and then out of reciprocity, okay, yeah, we'll scratch your back too and we'll buy your stuff. When actually, so this particular argument goes, if anything, it's the other way around. That our nation, I'm just, let's throw out this example or this episode, I'm an American, so I'll just speak from the perspective of the United States, the, the benefit to Americans in one sense from international trade, just at a, at a certain crude level, is all of the goods that we get from abroad, right? If 
if Japan sends us a bunch of Toyotas that were manufactured over there, then, you know, how does that help Americans? Well, because Americans now can drive around in Toyotas and we don't have to use our scarce resources to build vehicles for Americans to drive in, right? That frees up those resources to do other stuff with. They're just like in general, at the household level, if somebody comes over for dinner and brings you a bottle of wine, that's not hurting you. This you're getting something, right? So that on one level, you can look at it that way. And so you say from that perspective, goods from abroad flowing into the United States makes Americans poorer. And if as a regrettable necessity, in order to keep those goods coming, we have to ship goods that we make outside of our borders so that foreigners can get their hands on those goodies, there's a sense in which that's a cost to us. Okay, so again, there's one perspective that you'll often see, like uh, like if a Steve Landsberg or a Greg Mankiw is talking about international trade and they're just talking very basic just to get people warmed up, they might open with something like that and say, hey, hey, you're getting things backwards. In general, imports are benefits and exports are costs. Right? That, and then they'll follow it up with say, that doesn't mean we should just try to always import everything and export nothing because in the long run, foreigners would stop sending us stuff. Why are they going to keep sending us cars if we never send them anything in return? What's in it for the Japanese? Right? And so then you'll, that leads into the next principle you will often see from like a Steve Landsberg or a Greg Mankiw to say, hey, in the long run, imports must equal exports. And the reason for that, they would argue, is to say, again, what's the point of international trade? You want to get stuff from other countries. The only reason you send them things is because that's the way you keep their stuff coming into your borders. Now, with this stuff, too, I should mention there's a complication. None of this stuff, even on their terms, the people who espouse these principles, has to be true on a pairwise country-by-country level. Right, we're talking more like the U.S. versus the world at large, just like um, at the household level. To to keep this analogy in float, the you, the consumption you get is like the benefit of of the market, right? That you get stuff, you get goodies, you know, whether goods or services that other people make, and you get to enjoy. And it's only a regrettable necessity that you have to sell stuff. For most people, like their labor, like that's how you earn an income. So the only reason you're allowed to go around town and buy things from merchants, you want to go see a movie, you want to buy some clothes, you want to buy a fancy car, is that you have income. And how do you get the income? Well, you have to sell goods and services yourself to other people, right? So if you are allowed to just go around town getting cars and watching movies and getting clothes and sushi meals and so forth, and no one expected you to work, that would be great. Right, that wouldn't be lamentable. That'd be awesome. It's oh, we have to work in order to generate the income so that we get to buy all those things. Right, so that's where these people are coming from when they espouse principles like this. And so, so now that I've I've tried to just get you to see where they're coming from, let me now do the flip side of that just to show. Yes, there's a sense in which that's true, and people need to understand that if the if you're talking to somebody and they think the whole point of international trade is to get foreigners to buy our stuff and that it's only a regrettable necessity, like a, okay, a quid pro quo, I guess we'll buy your stuff to be fair about it, then you, that's backwards, right? I, so I agree, if you're talking to someone who's thinking it, of things at that level, then it helps to hit them up with, well, no, if you think about it, right, the benefit of trade is we get cars from Japan, so we don't have to build them ourselves and, and so on. But you can't stop there. That's my point. That that alone is not the end of the story. Because again, just continue with the analogy of an individual household. And, and yes, it is true that if you could go around town and just buy stuff and merchants would keep selling it to you and you didn't need to generate an income yourself, that would be great. That's clearly not going to happen. So you do need to work. But now... You wouldn't conclude, therefore, that it was being irresponsible or that there was some fallacy involved if someone said, hey, in general, I would like to have an income higher than my consumption in a given period. I want to live below my means, 
right? That wouldn't be a crazy thing for somebody to say. We would think that'd be very responsible, generally speaking, right? And so that is the analog in international trade of having um, a current account surplus. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to these concepts more in the future of this episode. <laughs> I don't mean down the road. Okay. So, but I'm just telling you like the terms of the accounting. All right. So the sort of Trump fan, MAGA fan, who's big on tariffs and, and wants to promote exports, they're actually not saying something crazy for thinking that, yeah, as a general rule, it would be good if we had net exports. If, if foreigners bought more of our stuff than vice versa, just like with a given household, if you said in general, when I talk to my CPA at the end of the year, I would like to, I'd like to see that what I sold of my stuff, like my labor services to my employer, had a higher market value than what I spent on other people's stuff, particularly if we're just talking about consumption, all right? Because the difference there is savings. Okay, so now let's just let it get more nuanced. When the mainstream guys like a Steve Landsberg or a Greg Mankiw, if they heard me say that, I think what they would say is something like, well, yeah, we're talking about the long run. That's what we said. In the long run, exports must equal imports. In the long run. At any given time period, there can be discrepancies. That's fine. And they say, like, for a household, yeah, you, you're in your prime working years, you want to live below your means and build up assets. But then that's because in your retirement, you draw them down. Right? And they say, what's, what's the point of saving? if not to have future consumption, right? They might say that. Like, that's the whole point of saving. It's just, do you, you, know, you earn income. Do you want to consume it now? Or do you want to consume it in the future? And if you want to consume it in the future, you save it now. And then, it, you know, it earns interest or dividends or capital gains, you know, whatever vehicle you're using to save it and defer it. But ultimately, the whole point of that, the rationale of saving and investing is to increase future income. And why do you want to increase future income? Ultimately, because you want to increase future consumption. If you never got to consume, what would be the point of earning an income? They might say, right? So <laughs> again, with this focus, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just got to keep saying, oh, but then the next element is because you can take these arguments and you, it's like you can never stop, or at least there's always, or not. there is often... On the other hand, or let's take it one step further, though, and that's what I'm doing here. I will do one more of these, then I'll stop. Don't worry on this particular train of argument. I'm just showing you the back and forth. Even there, though, yes, you want to, in general, you're doing, a, you know, you're sitting down with your financial planner and you're saying, here's my income and okay, we're going to save and then we're going to send the kids to college and we're going to do this and I'm going to assume I'm going to live to be this many years old and blah, blah, blah. And I got to have my uh, uh, long care, long term care rider and my insurance policy or whatever I'm doing to fund in case I got to go into hospice and blah, 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 right? You're doing all this stuff, but still most people, especially if they're like upper middle class or wealthier, assume that when they die, the value of their estate is going to be positive. And that's a big part of what they do with their financial planner is to try to minimize like the inheritance tags and oh, let's set up a trust and let's do this. And then, oh, if we do that, we can blah, blah, blah. And the kids can claim up to this amount. Right, you're not assuming that your lifetime income equals your lifetime consumption as of right now in present discounted value terms, right? So it's not true that for you as an individual, in the long run, your income equals your consumption. That's not true, typically, right? And then you could say, oh, sure, but still you're going to bequeath, like what's the point of giving wealth and inheritance to your heirs except to fuel their consumption? And, and yeah, you, that's true, but even with them, you know, if, if you hand over, if you accumulate when, and when you die, you give your kids an estate that's valued at $3 million, you wouldn't want them to then on net consume $3 million more than they earn in their lifetimes and hence squander the family fortune right? You would expect that when they die, they give to your grandkids more than $3 million if, if they've conducted themselves properly. With all this stuff, I'm not worried about inflation, obviously, folks. Just trying to keep the, the number of <laughs> moving parts to a minimum here in the analysis, right? So notice, 
all of this is, is perfectly coherent. It is still the case that, yes, the point of earning an income is to be able to fuel consumption. That's, that's why you sell your goods or services in the marketplace for money is so that you can go buy things in the marketplace. But you don't merely spend on consumption. You also invest the money in order to enhance your income down the road and say, well, well yeah, there's a sense in which that's ultimately about consumption. But do you see what I'm saying? It's not the case that any particular decision maker, given his or her time horizon, has to think, oh, I want to just consume exactly my total income during my lifetime. Again, with, you know, present discounted value and all that stuff. That's not the case. And there's nothing weird about thinking, if possible, I should conduct my affairs as a good steward of the resources that were handed to me from my ancestors to add to that. And so that in general, every generation should be handing over more wealth to the next generation. And that kind of dovetails with society at large that we expect the standard of living of humanity to rise over time, not merely because of technological discoveries and, you know, scientific breakthroughs, but also from the steady accumulation of capital. That even if we didn't come up with a better way to make stuff, we could just rely on existing knowledge and that over time, through saving and accumulation of physical investment, our productivity would be higher, right? That our great grandkids are going to work with better tools and equipment than we are. And that's why for an hour of their labor, they're going to be able to make more stuff. Even if between now and when our grandkids are working, there's no new technological innovations. There, there will be in practice, but even if there weren't, it would still be the case that our grandkids for an hour of their labor on average are going to be more physically productive than we are today. Okay, so I'm just saying these things are all consistent. And so I'm showing, I think, the limitations of the framework when like a Greg Mankiw or a Steve Landsberg says, oh, in the long run, exports must equal imports. That that doesn't need to be the case. Um, and that there's nothing illogical or incoherent about people thinking, yeah, in general, I would like my country to have net exports because that's in a, in a sense like building up our assets for down the road. Like it just puts us in a better position economically, right? You could think that plausibly if the analog to, of that in, the, in your household example or framework is the household that lives below its means and, you know, accumulates net financial assets that they then bequeath to, or it doesn't have to be financial assets. It could be physical assets too. Like you could own a factory or something that you invested in, right? That there's nothing weird about that. Okay. Let me just mention as an aside, part of the rhetorical bang for the buck that Landsberg or Mankiw gets from espousing that principle to say in the long run, exports equal imports for a given country. So to be clear, for planet Earth as a whole, of course, exports have to equal imports. One nation's export is another nation's import, right? So clearly... For the system as a whole, exports always equal imports. We're here just talking about from an individual country's perspective. Do exports have to equal imports? And in any given time period, no, that doesn't need to be the case. What is true is if some countries on planet Earth are running net exports, then it has to be the accounting flip side. There must be some countries that are running net imports. That's got to be true. All right, so it can't be the case that every country is net exporting in a given time period. Okay. Back to what I was trying to say is partly the reason a Landsberg or a Mankiw will espouse that principle to say, hey, in the long run, the whole point of exporting is to generate the income with which we buy foreign imports. And that the, the goal is to get imported goods that we, you know, on better terms than we could produce domestically. Just like with the household. There's a reason you don't grow your own food, make your own clothes, make your own car. No, instead, you specialize in what you're really good at, and you go to your job, and you do that. That's what you focus on, and that's how you generate the income with which you then go in from other people who are specializing in you know, being farmers or making cars or making clothes. 
and you spend your money with those people. And that's how we all end up with a higher standard of living by specializing in what, what's called our comparative advantages, making more than we need personally, and then going to the marketplace and swapping those goods and services for each other. And we all walk away with a much higher standard of living than if we each narrowly were self-sufficient. Okay. So that's kind of the background. And now again, ManQ or Landsberg, when they say, so in the long run, exports equal imports. And part of what they get from that is to say, so if you're ironically, if you enact measures like high punitive tariffs that discourage imports, thinking, ah, we want to get a favorable trade balance. You know, we, we want to, right now, all oh, the U.S. is running a trade deficit. We don't like that. So here's what we're going to do. Let's jack up tariff rates to discourage Americans from importing foreign goods. And so then, given that we're exporting a certain amount, if our imports fall, maybe the, the negative will flip to a positive and our exports will be higher than our imports and we can start running net exports for a while. And so the Man Mancus and Landsbergs of the world will say that's very short-sighted because there's a feedback mechanism. If again, they're thinking since in the long run exports equal imports, that's not going to work. What's going to end up happening is be, if because of high tariff rates, for example, Americans now are, are importing less than intuitively, that means foreigners are getting fewer dollars now, like leaving the country metaphorically. And so now they have fewer dollars with which to buy U.S. exports. So just to pick illustrative examples, if the U.S. all of a sudden puts really high tariffs on Japanese cars, cars that were like literally produced in Japan and put on a ship and crossing the ocean to come into be on U.S. roads. So if they stop buying those cars from Japan, well, now the Japanese don't have as many U.S. dollars with which to buy U.S. exports of wheat. And so by clamping down and reducing the amount of U.S. imports, the argument goes, that's necessarily going to reduce, perhaps with a lag, the ability of U.S. exporters to keep up their exports. And so you're not going to improve the trade balance. All you're going to do is restrict the two-way flow of trade if you just narrowly clam down on one vector of it. Okay? So I think that's true, but Again, it's my concern is the way they get there is by espousing this principle. That, oh, yeah, in the long run, exports equal imports. And that, I think, is, is more dubious. Because, again, in the household analogy, I don't think you'd want to say in the long run, income equals consumption. That, that, you know, you could say, well, okay, if the long run means out to seven generations, okay. But isn't that kind of silly? Likewise, with a country, a country could have exports higher than imports for 300 years. There's nothing in the accounting that prevents that from happening. And so what does it mean to say in the long run? You know what I mean? So that's kind of what I'm getting at. But I do think putting aside the question of, you know, oh, should we be going around holding up this principle that in the long run exports equal imports? I don't think we should because it's liable to confusion and it's arguably incorrect depending on, you know, your assumptions and how you define the terms. But I do think Forget that. Just in general, yes, other things equal, whatever the current status is of the U.S. trade balance, if all of a sudden there is a crackdown making it harder for Americans to import foreign goods, then that will make foreigners have a harder time buying our stuff. And so a, an aggressive crackdown on U.S. imports will also lead to difficulty for U.S. exporters. It doesn't have to be dollar for dollar, but those pressures are still going to be there. And so let me just take a moment to walk through some of the realistic complications there. That um, you might think, what are you talking about, Bob? If you sell dollars to Japanese, the Japanese people use yen. Well, right. And so there is that, complication. And so what, what would happen is if Americans, because of high tariff rates placed on Japanese goods, now switch their demand away and they don't try to spend as much buying Japanese-made vehicles as they do, you know, making American vehicles or whatever, 
than what happens in the foreign exchange markets. That means now there are fewer dollars chasing yen. And so that makes um, the dollar strengthen against the yen. And then that makes it harder for Japanese importers to buy U.S. wheat because now wheat has become more expensive because it's priced in dollars originally. And so then as the dollar strengthens against the yen, from the Japanese importer's perspective, oh, American wheat all of a sudden just got more expensive. So they're not going to buy as much of it in, phys in terms of like physical bu bushels. Okay, so that's how it works. All right? All right. I got a lot of stuff to cover, so I'll move on. I, I could, with all these things, it's like an onion. You could keep pe peeling back the layers of subtlety and nuance and realism, but I'll stop with this train of thought on, on that level of difficulty. All right, but again, so the principle is, just to not get mixed up, I think it is correct to say it's short-sighted. If what your goal is is to promote net U.S. exports, you want to have a favorable trade balance to just crack down and make it harder for Americans to import foreign goods, that that's going to be largely self-defeating because there's a countervailing force that to the extent that that's successful, that will make the dollar strengthen, other things equal, and then that makes U.S. goods more expensive to foreign importers. And so by f restricting the flow of imports going into the U.S., you're also going to restrict the flow of exports leaving the U.S. Again, it's not necessarily going to be dollar for dollar. You can come up with scenarios where it's, you know, the, the effect is there, but it's just not completely a wash. But I'm just saying that effect is going to be there. And so you have to just keep that kind of stuff in mind. And again, to go back to the landsberg Q perspective, the intuition behind that is to a first approximation, why are the Japanese selling us cars? Well, it's because they want to get stuff from us. They're just going to give us cars for free. Why would they do that? What's in it for them? But if, among other things, oh, because they're getting a bunch of wheat from us, well, then that makes sense. And so now all of a sudden, if we're not buying their cars, then how are they going to get our wheat? So it's actually the other way around, that why would we be continue to send them wheat if they're not sending us cars in exchange? Right, you can think of it that way. Okay, now let's move on to a different topic. If all countries did were engaging in barter transactions for the actual goods, then, yeah, it would, it would totally make sense. And trade would always be balanced, and it would just be a matter of, you know, we would send a certain amount of wheat to Japan, and they would send us cars, and that would be it. And there'd be no... Um, consequences of those transactions beyond the immediate effect. There'd be no long-term impact. But in practice, with international trade, you can have more sophisticated exchanges that involve entities or, or quantities over time. Right? So specifically, a country is allowed to run a trade deficit. Right? A country can import more than it exports in a given period. There's nothing stopping that from happening. And when, so how does it do that? Why, for, In a given period, it is possible the U.S. could import cars from Japan even though it doesn't export anything. Why would the Japanese do that? Well, they would do that if they get financial assets. If they get claims on future flows from the U.S., then they might do that. Again, going back to the household analogy, just like why would I go to my employer and sell all my labor hours week after week to get income if I didn't, in that same year, go and spend all of it on consumption? What's in it for me? And the obvious answer is, well, because if you live below your means, you're accumulating assets that can help you down the road. That's why you would do it. Okay? So um, in the international trade context, one truism that is very useful is to say um, the current, what's called the current account is the flip side of the capital account. So look, if there's a current account deficit, then there's a capital account surplus or the other way around. If there's a capital account deficit, then there's a current account surplus. So if 
for example, just to give you an illustration, suppose the U.S. government runs a $300 billion trade deficit, or sorry, $300 billion budget deficit, and it finances that by selling the treasury bonds to Japanese investors. Okay, so the U.S. government wants to spend $300 billion more than it takes in their tax revenue. It needs to come up with that money somehow. So the treasury issues bonds. Somebody has to pay for those bonds so the government can go spend the money on whatever, buying tanks or social security payments or whatever. And suppose they get the money from Japanese investors who now add $300 billion in present market value of treasury bonds to their portfolios. That is called a capital account surplus from the perspective of the United States. There's more capital flowing into the U.S. than vice versa. Japanese investors are investing $300 billion in U.S. dollar-denominated assets, namely the treasury bonds. Whereas in this example, we're assuming, assuming U.S. investors aren't buying Japanese shares of corporate stock or bonds from the Japanese government, okay? So now the question is, okay, the Japanese investors got an asset. Now, they own now claims on future cash flows from the U.S. So what does the U.S. have to show for it? How do we benefit from issuing liabilities on us that now foreign people, namely Japanese, own? Oh, well, what if they send us $300 billion worth of cars right now? Then that makes sense, okay? These things, again, I'm, I'm being simplistic, and there's always this issue when you talk about international trade to think in terms of national aggregates. Obviously, there's not like one person who's just the USA doing this stuff. It's different people, but the way you do the accounting, if you're going to do it, if you're going to go down this path, you know, these are the kind of statements that pop out. Okay? And so... That's one way of understanding, you know, why is there a a trade deficit in this particular example? It was because we supposed that there was no other trade going on. The U.S. government needed to borrow money, and it borrowed it from these Japanese investors. And so in terms of the, you know, the physical flow of goods, there's a sense in which the Japanese sent over a bunch of cars today in exchange for our legally binding promises that, oh, down the road, we will send you wheat, for example, right? And so that's what can happen, that the Japanese investors now are going to get a flow of dollars over time in terms of interest income. And if they want, you know, they could take those dollars and, you know, the dollars could trade for yen and then they could take the yen and turn them back into dollars and buy U.S. exports of wheat. And so if you want to think in terms of the intertemporal flows, it could be the Japanese sent a bunch of cars today to get a flow of bushels of wheat indefinitely. You could think of it like that. Okay. Just like at the household level, if you live below your means and came up with an extra $3,000 and then you put it into, you know, bank CDs rolling over, that would generate you. A, a perpetual yield, and you could take that and go buy steak dinners with that or something, right? And as long as you kept your principal at 3000 and just consumed only the interest that, that kicked off year after year, then you could do that. And so there would be a sense in which you took your present income and saved and invested it, and then it gave you a flow of, you know, one steak dinner per year forever. And that wouldn't be living above your means, right? So whatever you st- were still spending based on the income from your employer, that one-time decision up front to set aside $3,000 and start rolling it over in bank CDs and then living off the interest on that, that then kicked off, now your consumption would be permanently higher. All right. And, th- and there you wouldn't be Im- impairing your uh, ability to generate income down the road. And so that's what the, what's called the current account is when we're, when we're doing international trade, right? So if one country accumulates a bunch of assets 
entitling it to income from foreign sources, the country can run a trade deficit with those other countries, even if the current account is balanced. Right? So, um, that's, that's partly what's going on. So when people speak of like, oh, a trade deficit means we're living below our means or sorry, above our means and a trade surplus means we're living below our means. That's not quite right. It would be right if you were just starting at time zero and there was no prior history of trading and financial assets, then it would be true. But in general, no, the, the statement that you want to use is the current account. Right. That again, because if you have past accumulation of assets, your country can run a trade deficit if that's just what, you know, what you're reaping from having lived below your means in the past. Just like, again, at the household level, if you save a bunch, then you can consume more than your income, your, your like paycheck income. And that doesn't mean you're actually reducing your total assets because those other financial assets are generating income themselves. That's the way to think about it in terms of the accounting. Okay, so that now leads into another train of thought. When people are opposed to trade deficits, they will often think of the financing of them as like running up the credit card. And they'll say, yeah, when the U.S., for example, is running a trade deficit with the rest of the world, what's financing that? Because again, it's not that the rest of the world is just going to send us goodies for nothing. It'll say the U.S. is issuing net financial assets to the rest of the world, that U.S. liabilities to a bunch of foreigners are rising. And so foreigners might be accumulating treasury bonds. Foreigners might be acquiring, you know, conventional corporate bonds, but they also might be buying stock in U.S. companies. Or what alarms people even more is foreigners might be investing in U.S. real estate. And that's the sense, right? So, geez, why would Japan send us a bunch of cars? Well, if they bought some houses in Florida and Manhattan, and that's what they were getting in exchange for sending us a bunch of cars today, that could make sense from their point of view, right? And so the people who are um, alarmed at the U.S., quote, living above its means and running trade deficits would say, this is unsustainable. We need to stop. This is only because the U.S. government is so profligate and, you know, Americans in general just need to to stop selling their birthright in order for a mess of pottage today. You know, you can use metaphors like that. So that's correct as far as it goes, that it is true if one country has a large trade deficit, it's possible that what's generating that and making it happen is that the people in that country are living above their means and basically, you know, putting consumption on the credit card, just like at a household level. If you wanted to go take a trip to Vegas or take a you know, trip to some Caribbean island and you didn't have any savings you know, from your job and you couldn't have, your, the income from your employer wouldn't find when you couldn't fit that in your budget, you could just put on a credit card. So, yep, you enjoyed the trip. It happened. But now you owe a bunch of money to Visa or whoever and it starts rolling over at high finance charge rates and that's going to permanently impact you know, your, your future consumption possibilities. Cause now you got to take some of your future income flows and use it to at least service the interests, if not to knock down the principal of that debt. Okay. So that's true, but that's not the only possibility. And this is what the guys like Steve Landsberg or Greg Mankiw or Arthur Laffer might point out is that to the extent that foreigners view the United States is a great place to invest well, then that would also generate this outcome, right? So instead of viewing it as, oh yeah, Americans are profligate and living above their means, you could do the accounting flip side and say, well, no, what if it's just that the U.S. You know, has a fairly stable, for all its flaws, still has a very attractive regulatory climate tax structure. The rule of law is much better in the U.S. than it is a lot of places around the world. And so wealthy individuals from around the world, what do they, where do they want to park their money? They want to put it, into the U.S. It's a very safe, dependable return, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And so then how is that going to happen? Why would the United States 
allow foreigners to get to acquire all of these claims and future U.S. output, well, the foreigners got to send us stuff right now. And so they send us goodies. And that's, that's the trade. Okay. And so if that sounds ominous to you, we can come up with examples at the household or the um, corporate level where it's not ominous, right? So you're a, a young person, you have an aptitude for the medical sciences, and you want to go to medical school, you want to become a doctor. And oh, geez, law, uh, medical school is very expensive. How, what do we do? Well, you can take out student loans. And as long as your forecasts are correct and you end up becoming a heart surgeon and making tons of money, once you're up and running, you can afford to knock out your debts, your student loans. Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. In the current environment with all the regulations and government shenanigans, yeah, I don't like the higher educational market and so on in the student loan market. But I'm just saying, even in Rothbardia land, you could imagine some student from a very modest background, but yet who is going to make a great heart surgeon should be able to get financing to go to medical school, right? And so there, it, it would be somewhat misleading to point to that medical st student, you know, who's like in their second year and who is borrowing from outsiders and accumulating and, and having this growing debt owed to outside lenders and say, oh, this person's being irresponsible and living above his means. He should, he should, you know, that's no, you're, you're kind of misunderstanding the situation there for a corporate example, suppose a company is doing great, but it's current factories are running at, at capacity and they think that, oh yeah, our, our ad campaigns, our marketing is doing really well. And we think next year, our sales, if we can keep up with the demand are going to increase 30%. But right now we just can't, we're, we're running everything full tilt. We got, you know, full shifts, fully manned. What do we do? Let's build a new factory. Oh, but you know what? We don't have the cash on hand to be able to do it internally, to finance it internally. Okay. So let's issue some bonds to then build this new factory so we can increase our capacity to increase our revenue down the road. All right. There's nothing profligate or irresponsible about a company doing that. And yet, in terms of the accounting, what happens for that period, they are spending more than what their income was, right? They're incurring extra liabilities of money they owe to outsiders, but that's not unsustainable, assuming that their forecasts are correct. That's a very sensible thing to do, okay? And so now at the country level, let's say that a bunch of people read Rothbard and Hoppe and Murphy, throw that in there. And they say, oh, we got uh, anarcho-capitalism is the wave of the future. This, this is just amazing. We had a society based on free market principles and full respect for property rights. And they go and they somehow buy some island in the Pacific and they turn it into Rothbard land. What would happen? Well, presumably there would be a bunch of investors around the world who understood, oh yeah, this place has a promising future and they would want to invest in it. Like they would try to buy real estate in it or the companies that were founded there, they would want to buy stock in those companies. Or if the companies there were issuing bonds, they would want to buy those bonds and so forth. And so the physical reality, what would happen is barrels of crude oil and all kinds of steel and cement and blah, blah, blah from around the world would all flow to this little island in the Pacific so they could start building all their factories and bridges and whatnot and missile defense systems, you know, because NATO's eventually going to try to say, hey, these guys are uh, bad. We're going to have to invade them, <laughs> right? And, all, and building all of the secure vaults for the banks, they're going to have gold bars in there because, of course, it's going to be 100% reserved because, you know, they're going to really respect Joe Salerno there. Okay, so what would you see in terms of the trade accounting? I imagine Rothbard land when it first forms, if it's an island in the Pacific, is going to have huge trade deficits because on net, to get that place up and running, a bunch of real resources from around the world are going to have to flow into there so they can build up their infrastructure and get up and running. And there's nothing irresponsible or prof profligate about that. Okay. So my, I guess, how do I sum up this last round of considerations? 
that when you're thinking of a country running perpetual trade deficits, and again, strictly speaking, it's current account deficits, um, that yes, that could be the symptom of a fundamental profligacy, that there's a sense in which, oh yeah, the people in this country are just being very uh, short-sighted and uh, hedonistic and they're they're just spending about they're living above their means and they can finance that for a while by issuing ever more liabilities to foreigners who are only too happy to say okay sure yep yep we have now more and more claims on your future income and eventually those chickens are going to come home to roost and there's going to be a very painful correction that could be what's going on or it's also possible a given country could have a long string of trade deficits and that could be explained by the fact that this is such a great place to invest in. And as long as the um, the assets of this country are growing more than the external claims on them, on net, the people in the country could still themselves grow wealthier over time. It's not that, you know, a, a bigger and bigger share of their GDP is now earmarked to flow out to pay off the interest they owe to foreigners. That doesn't need to be the case. Okay, so in practice, I do think there, well, I think there's a little bit of both going on. So I do think that, yes, certainly, and, and by profligacy, we can include the U.S. government. If the U.S. government all of a sudden cuts spending next week, or let's say February, early February, once Elon and uh, Vivek can start having their ideas implemented, if the U.S. government drastically slashed spending so that U.S. government borrowing dropped, that alone, other things equal, would do a lot to reduce the U.S. trade deficit. Again, other things equal. And in terms of the mechanism, just to walk through that in case you're curious, you could say, well, other things equal. The U.S. government's not borrowing as much. That means the yield on treasuries can fall. And so now foreigners don't find U.S. bonds as attractive. And so that makes the dollar weaken. And so now that makes foreign imports more expensive to Americans and it makes U.S. exports cheaper for foreigners. And so that, you know, that string of consequences would cause the U.S. trade deficit to fall, other things equal. So notice with this stuff, it might be counterintuitive. You might have thought if the U.S. government slashes spending, that that would make the dollar strengthen because now America is stronger economic. And no, it's actually the other way around in these particular examples. Again, other things equal. All right. I will stop there. There's more stuff I could cover, but we'll save that for future episodes. Again, big picture here. I'm not trying to get you to be for or against tariffs to think Trump is a great guy or a monster. I'm just trying to clarify. I see people arguing on social media about these topics and the stuff is pretty complex and nuanced. and Partisans on both camps will grab onto a principle or two and then think that's the whole story when a lot of times, no, it's, yeah, what you're saying is, is true insofar as it goes, but there's a lot more going on. And that maybe even the person on the other side of the argument is also clinging to a true principle and the two of you are, you know, one guy saying, no, no, the elephant really does have a big trunk. And the other one's saying, no, no, I'm telling you, this tail is very skinny. And you're both right. All right, folks, watch out for those elephants. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.